Thank you. Thank you, Marianne. Thank you. Um, yeah, as Marianne said, it's uh, four in the morning my time, so if I look a little stupefied up here, it's pro I hope it's not the diet, it's just... <laughs> anyway, let me, um, a background quickly. I'm a journalist, I'm not a doctor, I'm not a PhD. I approach this as an investigative science reporter when I got into this field about uh, almost 20 years ago. And um, I got in because my friends in the physics community said uh, if I was interested in bad science, which I was, I should look at some of the stuff in public health. And um, it turns out it's become my career ever since. Uh, so what I want to do is give you a little bit of my learning experience. I had no preconceptions when I went into this. I ate a low-fat diet. I was um, getting heavier every year, like most of us. And um, I had the opportunity to do five years of research, basically when the internet made it possible to find, uh, in effect, every first primary source going back to the 19th century. At one point, I had five researchers around the country whose job was just to go to libraries and, and Xerox articles and entire books for me, if necessary. So I think I had the opportunity, beginning around 2002, to do more research than anyone had ever done. And what I want to give you with this talk, again, is part of the history. I grew up in physics and uh, as a physics student, and in physics, when you learn about the science, you learn about the history attached to it. Um, I mean, if you think about it, we don't just think of the laws of gravity, we think of Newton's laws of gravity. We don't think of relativity, it's Einstein's relativity. And many of the great names in physics are people that, uh, names that we're all familiar with inherently because it's part of the culture. But in medicine and public health, the we learn, tend to learn the science, we're taught what to believe, but we're not taught why we believe it and what the history of that belief is. And one of the revelations, a major revelation I had in doing my research is that when you go back and look at the history, you find that a lot of our fundamental beliefs in nutrition, obesity, diabetes, are unsupported by the evidence. So just to, for context, I'm gonna give you, these are the, the, the obesity epidemic in the US, and this is why we're here, this is why I did this, is we're trying to understand this phenomenon, this massive 250% increase in obesity rates in the US and around the world now, to a greater or lesser extent, depending on the country, and it goes along with the diabetes epidemic, and the diabetes number numbers are actually significantly more frightening in most countries. In the U.S., for instance, if you go back to the early 1960s and you believe the numbers from the Centers of Disease Control, I'm not sure I do entirely, but if you believe them, diabetes prevalence has increased 900% in the past uh, 50 years. Um, an unprecedented epidemic, and it should be terrifying all of us. And along with obesity and diabetes comes this cluster of chronic diseases. So this is also related to what Asim talked about, the insulin resistance and metabolic syndrome. And if you're getting heavier, um, you have an increased risk of stroke, of heart disease, of gallbladder disease. Uh, you're likely to be hypertensive. You have an increased risk of neurodegeneration, of Alzheimer's disease, uh, fatty liver disease, which is now epidemic in the U.S. and uh, unprecedented numbers. We're seeing uh, non-alcoholic fatty liver disease in, in children now. Um, osteoarthritis, your cancer risk goes up. So the conventional thinking is that whatever happens when you're getting fat or maybe the inflammatory molecules that are released by the fat tissue somehow increases the risk of these diseases. But um, what I want to suggest is a, a different causality, uh, a simpler causality. Basically, whatever makes us fat uh, also increases the risk of these diseases, which increases the risk of premature death. So the point is this talk could have been called Why We Get Sick. Um, it's easier to give the talk as why we get fat, because the evidence for our understanding of obesity is easier to demonstrate uh, the misconception. So when we talk about why we get fat, the conventional wisdom is pretty simple. The fundamental cause of obesity and overweight, as the WHO says, is an energy imbalance between calories consumed and expended. Um, scientists will refer to this as a, obesity as an energy balance disorder. I have friends in academia who have chairs in energy balance in their, in their institutions. Um, simple way to think of it is you know, more calories in than calories out. We get fatter, uh, we overeat. The biblical terminology is gluttony and sloth. 
Um, and one of the things you want to do in science is you want to explain, I mean, the fundamental thing you want to do in any science is explain the observations, what we see in nature, in the laboratory. So the observation we want to explain with this hypothesis of obesity is the obesity epidemic itself. And the way we do that is we blame it basically on increased prosperity or a toxic obesogenic environment. So what do we mean by an obesogenic environment? This is how two researchers at Yale put it in a recent paper. They said, in our modern mechanized society, caloric demands are minimized, so we're all sedentary. We don't have to work hard to, for our food, for our living. And highly palatable, calorie-dense foods and beverages are readily available. So there's a vending machine, a, 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 you know, a market. Uh, there's always food available. We're always eating. And, and these changes have fostered this current pandemic of obesity and the, the diseases that go with it. So this is what that hypothesis looks like. Um, too much food, too little physical activity leads to overeating. Okay, energy in, greater than energy out. And the result is this insulin resistance, obesity, and the obesity epidemic. And I just want to ask to get a feel for the audience. How many of you sort of generally believe this is true? You can be honest. <laughs> so most of you guys are already sort of in our camp. That's nice. Okay, well, I'm going to try and convince you again, not only that it's not true, it's, it's actually meaningless. It's, to me, it's the biggest single mistake I can imagine in the history of modern science. Um, I was stunned when I started thinking about this, and all you really have to do is start thinking about what this means. But we're going to go through it, again, from a historical perspective. We're going to treat it like a hypothesis, because it is a hypothesis, and it actually has a history. So if we were going to, this was physics, this would be known as von Norden's energy balance hypothesis or Newberg's energy balance hypothesis. These were the two researchers who were most, uh, 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 you know, the greatest proponents of this thinking and the ones who got it to catch on in the United States and around the world. So von Norden was a leading authority in Germany at the turn of the 20th century in diabetes and obesity, and Louis Newberg was a University of Michigan researcher. And it came out of some fascinating history, again, some context. Beginning in the 1860s, the modern science of nutrition was founded in Germany, and it was founded with the creation of these room-sized devices called calorimeters to measure energy expenditure in living animals. So you could measure the energy in foods by burning them in what's called a bomb calorimeter, and then you could measure the energy that animals or humans expend by putting them in these room-sized calorimeters, and suddenly you can measure the energy in and the energy out of various animals and organisms, and the entire science of nutrition for the next 50 years was either vitamin and mineral deficiency diseases, or it was calorimetry, this measurement of energy in and out. And what's fascinating, in science, the tools we have available sort of determine what questions we can ask, and the questions we ask determine the answers we get. So by the 1910s, 1920s, this idea had developed that obesity is an energy balance disorder because what we could do was measure energy balance. And simultaneously in physics and chemistry, uh, researchers came up with the laws of thermodynamics as one of the great breakthroughs in physics in the late, 20th, late 19th century. In the 1880s, Max Rubner, a famous German physiologist, nutritionist, demonstrated that these laws of thermodynamics hold true for living organisms. By the 1890s, two Americans, Atwater and Benedict, spent actually years of their life demonstrating that thermodynamics also holds for humans and pioneered the science of calorimetry. And by the 1900s, this guy von Norden is declaring caloric imbalance as a cause of obesity. As von Norden said, the ingestion of a quantity of food greater than that required by the body leads to an accumulation of fat and to obesity. Excuse me. Morning effect. Should the disproportion be continued over a considerable period? After Van Norden put this forth, Lewis Newberg in the U.S. took it over. And Newberg had one revelation. He said, all obese persons are alike in one fundamental respect. They literally overeat. Okay, this was based on the work of a woman named Hilda Brook, a German pediatrician who had come to the U.S. in the 1930s and had actually done a series of studies. She founded the first obesity clinic at Columbia University in the U.S and did a series of studies of obese children, 200 children, and concluded that no matter what their mother said about how they might eat like a bird, in reality they ate a lot of food. 
Okay, so Newberg took this revelation, said all obese persons literally overeat, and if they do, obesity is caused either by this perverted appetite, which is eating too much, or a lessened outflow of energy, which is insufficient expenditure. So it's the energy balance theory. And this is what it looks like. Basically, it's a full body thing. Bring in more calories than you expend. The, in the, in the calories in between are gonna get stuck in the fat tissue. The problem with this theory is you have to explain why obese people don't adjust, okay? Because this is a behavioral issue. And Louis Newberg, the very slender fellow in the photo, and I showed the photo on purpose because I actually think it's very hard for people who are built like Newberg to understand obesity. Um, my metaphor is childbirth. You could have uh, male OB obstetricians and gynecologists, they could deliver tens of thousands of babies, but they will not understand childbirth as well as one woman who has given birth, okay? And the same thing with obesity. If you have somebody who's never had this problem of putting on weight no matter what they do, they can't imagine what it's like to put on weight no matter what they do, and so they think that the problem is behavioral. Those obese people just don't do what they do. So when Newberg was asked this question, why don't obese people adjust? Because that's under conscious control. They could eat less and exercise more. He said, because they suffer from various human weaknesses such as overindulgence and ignorance. Um, so now you've taken a problem, a physiological problem of excess fat in the body and you've put the problem in the head. Ignorance, self-indulgence, gluttony, and sloth. And this is what that theory ultimately does. So one thing we can do with any scientific hypothesis, the first thing you might do is look for counterexamples. Can we find examples of populations that have high levels of obesity but don't have any of this easily available food and the sedentary behavior? So hard-working populations that are poor. And if you actually go into the literature, you'll find dozens of them. So this is something I did, and I think the obesity community shouldn't have left it up to a journalist to do this. But you could go back to, for instance, 1928 with the Native Americans on the Sioux uh, Crow Creek Reservation, which is in the state of South Dakota. This was done a year after the U.S. government did a study of the conditions on the Native American populations in 1927 and concluded that the poverty on these populations were unimaginable by the standards of America in 1927. So you could imagine today how poor these people were. They lived four to eight people per room. They had no running water. They had no plumbing. They had no indoor toilets. Their food was delivered by government agencies. Basically, once a month, they got government rations. And yet, 40% of the women, 10% of the men, and a quarter of the children were distinctly fat. And this coincided with malnutrition and undernutrition stunting in the population. 20% of the women and the quarter of men and children were extremely thin, and there were signs of deficiency diseases in the population as well. And this uh, uh, association of obesity with malnutrition and stunting today is known as a dual or double burden of obesity and malnutrition. And you'll find nutritionists talking about the paradox that they see. How do you explain obese mothers with starving children? If you want to blame the obese mothers, the obesity on eating too much. So we could go through these populations. Trinidad, 1961, same problem. There's a malnutrition crisis. People are dying of deficiency diseases. The US government sends a team of researchers down to Trinidad, and they come back declaring that a third of women over 25 are obese, and obesity is a potentially serious medical problem in this population. The next year, an MIT, a nutritionist from the Massachusetts Institute of Technology goes down to Trinidad to quantify the diets being consumed and reports that they have less than 2,000 calories a day available to these people, and yet there's this high level of obesity. Um, the same thing, more of these populations, the top one, Bantu pensioners in South Africa. This is the poorest of a disenfranchised black population in South Africa in the midst of the apartheid era, and yet the mean weight of women over 60 was 165 pounds. 30% of the women were severely overweight. How did they get that fat if they had to eat too much food to do it? Um, back at the bottom, 1981, Mexican-Americans in Star County, Texas. Star County is right on the border of Mexico and Texas. It was a poor agricultural county in 1981 when a cardiologist from the University of Texas Southwestern Medical School went down to study heart disease in this population. 
Most of the inhabitants were working in agricultural labor and or in the oil fields in the country. This was a hard-working, poor Mexican-American population. There was one restaurant in Starr County, Texas in 1981. It was a Mexican restaurant. There was no McDonald's, no Burger Kings, no vending machines, none of that. And yet 50% of the women in their 50s were obese and 40% of the men in their 40s. This is similar to the levels of obesity we see in the U.S. today, but you can disassociate it from the effect of the food industry, from sedentary behavior, and just ask the question, why were these people fat? Because this is much simpler. Something is making this population fat. It's not normal to have this kind of levels of obesity, but we'd like to know what it is, and we can disassociate it from prosperity. So there were other shortcomings of this energy balance hypothesis that have been obvious all along. It was obvious to researchers 100 years ago. So for starters, if eating too much makes us fat, eating less should make us leaner. Okay, and we don't grow, we don't wake up one morning and find ourselves obese. We get fatter a little bit, a couple pound or two a year. Why is it anywhere along that line we can't rein in our diets? And yet when you actually do studies on the benefit of calorie-restricted diets, and the first such study was done in the 1940s, you find that they just don't work. And Hilda Brook, uh, well, let me skip to the next one. Um, the other problem is exercising more also doesn't work. Okay, so we know that eating less doesn't work. Um, Obesity is an energy balance issue. The idea it's either too much energy in or not enough out. I could quote meta-analyses like the Cochrane collaboration on the, how tiny the effect is of exercise programs on weight loss. But I find this more compelling. In 2007, the American Heart Association and the American College of Sports Medicine published joint physical activity guidelines. These are people who want us to work out regularly. They think that exercise is an inherent part of a healthy lifestyle, as do I. And you would expect them to spin the evidence for the benefits of physical activity, increasing your energy expenditure on everything, including weight loss. But this is what they say about this hypothesis that exercising more will help you lose weight. It says, it's reasonable to assume that persons with relatively high daily energy expenditures would be less likely to gain weight over time compared with those who have low energy expenditures, which is logically equivalent to saying, if I'm a couch potato, I'll be less likely to gain weight over time if I become a marathon runner than if I remain a couch potato. And then they say, so far, data to support this hypothesis are not particularly compelling. And the point is, this hypothesis is 100 to 150 years old. And if the best you could say about it is the data to support are not particularly compelling, it doesn't mean it's wrong. Maybe you just didn't do the studies right, but you should seriously consider the possibility that it's wrong. So now let me give you a way to think about this eating less, exercising more problem. Imagine when you were signed up for this conference today, you were also invited to a feast tonight. Okay, uh, right in this building. I don't know what it's called, but we have the ten best chefs, not just from Iceland, but from the whole east coast of the United States and from France. We've flown them all in, and we're going to have a feast the likes of which you've never seen in your life. It's going to be plate after plate after plate of enormous portions of unbelievably delicious food. And when you got the invitation to this feast, it said, bring your appetite, come hungry. What would you do today to make sure that when you got to the feast tonight, you could eat as much food as possible, you were as hungry as humanly possible, that you had really built up an appetite? And the answer is, I think you might eat less during the day, you know, skip a meal, certainly skip snacks, eat less during lunch. And I bet some of you, a significant amount, would say, you know, I think I'm going to exercise more today. If I was going to go to the gym, I'm going to work out longer. If I wasn't going to go to the gym, I'm going to the gym. And in fact, you know, this, this venue was only five miles from where I live. I think I'm going to walk, because if I walk, I'll build up an appetite. So what you can then ask yourself is, why is it the two things that any sane human being would do to make sure they're hungry, eat less, and exercise more, the things that we give advice to obese people to get them to lose weight? That alone should make you question your beliefs about the cause and the means of prevention of this disorder. So obesity is an energy balance disorder. We can ask the question, what does this mean? 
Okay, the Centers for Disease Control says weight management is all about balance, balancing the number of calories you consume with the number your body uses or burns off. So we want to ask this question, how closely do we have to balance intake to expenditure so that we don't gain two pounds of fat a year? Because if we gain two pounds of fat a year, that's 20 pounds in a decade, 40 pounds in 20 years, we'll go from being lean in our 20s, many of us were to obese in our 40s, as many of us will be or are. So I don't want that to happen. So let's go through the calculation. I first saw this calculation in a 1937 textbook written by the leading metabolism researcher in the United States, a fellow named Eugene Dubois, and he uses calculation for the very same purpose I'm going to use it. So a typical adult's food intake is 2,700 calories a day. It's about a million calories a year. It's about 10 million calories in a decade. It's 10 to 12 tons of food. So now we ask this question, how accurately do we have to balance calories in to calories out so we don't gain any more than 20 pounds over the course of a decade? And the answer is to within 21 calories a day. So what I mean by that is if I put 21 calories a day in my fat tissue that I don't burn, I am going to gain two pounds of fat a year. It's a simple calculation. It's eighth grade math. It's a shame we don't do it for everyone who thinks about practicing energy balance. 20 calories a day times 365 days in a year times 10 years divided by 3,500 calories per pound of fat is about 21 pounds in a decade. OK? It's 0.8% accuracy. So what I mean by that is 21 calories a day is about one bite of food, maybe one sip, two sips of Coke. So I'm a big guy. I probably eat about 3,000 calories a day. That's about 150 swallows of food. If I burn off or excrete 149 of them, and the 150th ends up in my fat tissue, I am preordained to get obese. I can't stop it from happening. Okay? It's 0.8% accuracy. As Dubois said, considering this number, there's no stranger phenomenon the maintenance of a constant body weight under marked variation in bodily activity and food consumption. If that's what we have to do to maintain our weight, to consciously balance calories in to calories out, and that's what lean people are doing and obese people aren't, it's impossible. Nobody can do that. And the question shouldn't be, why are some of us fat? The question should be, why aren't all of us fat, or half of us fat and the other half of us emaciated, because the math works both ways. There's got to be, what Dubois says, there has to be some other way that our bodies are maintaining body mass without this conscious or even unconscious manipulation by the brain of intake and expenditure. So now I'm going to show you some photos of naked human beings. I apologize. These are from the pre-World War II textbooks, and I'm going to be channeling the way other pre-World War II European researchers thought about obesity. Okay, again, one of the revelations of my research is there was an alternative hypothesis of obesity that existed in World War II among the best German and Austrian endocrinologists, metabolism, nutrition research at a time when all the best medical science in the world was done in Europe most of it by Germans and Austrians. In fact, there was virtually nothing going on in the United States. It was a backwater in medical science, with the exception of perhaps infectious disease research. So I'm going to show you how these people thought about obesity, because this is how I'm going to suggest we should all be thinking about it. So the first thing they said is genetics. We know that obesity is a huge genetic proponent. Okay, Obesity runs in families. What you have here is a lean pair of identical twins and obese pair of identical twins. And our calories theory might tell us why these twins are fat and those aren't. These twins uh, overate, took in more calories than they expend, and these twins practice perfect energy balance. But why do they get fat in the exact same ways? Why does the fat go to the same places on these people? Identical twins don't just have look-alike. It's not just their faces. Their body types are identical. What's determining how and where these women put on fat? And if we start asking questions like that, Instead of what our BMI is, is it over 30 or under 30, the Europeans were saying if we look at, and this is why they had these photos in the textbooks, if we look at where people get fat and when they get fat, we start to learn about this fattening process and what might be controlling it. Another way to look at this is animal husbandry. This is a, we've been breeding animals to have more or less uh, 
you know, the different uh, characteristics for, for centuries, millennia. So this is a lean uh, cow. It's a dairy cow. You could see the swollen udder. You could see it's so lean you could see the ribs. And this is Aberdeen Angus is a beef cow. Uh, it's a very stocky, beefy animal. You could see the intramuscular fat in this inset. And you could just ask the question, we know these are genes because these are different breeds of cattle. What is it that controls what do the genes control such that this animal's lean and this animal is beefy, for lack of a better word? And the answer is, well, it's unlikely that it controls how much they eat and exercise, okay? How many calories per bite of grass this animal takes in? Maybe this one grazes 10 hours a day and this one grazes 12 hours, or this one goes for a jog at night and this one goes into the barn and what? You know, here's another way to think about it. That this gives us a sign. I mean, it's, this animal is a producing milk. That's very energy expensive, okay? So maybe the calories are coming in and the genes are determining whether or not it's going to be used for milk rather than accumulate here as muscle, as fat and protein. So maybe these genes are what we could call fuel partitioning or fuel allocation genes. They don't determine how many calories go in and out. They determine how many calories, where those calories go. And if the calories accumulate here, they're not going to be able to use, be useful for expenditure. So this animal's not going to be a long distance runner. If they accumulate here, they're not going to be used for expenditure. And if they accumulate here, they're not accumulating there. So maybe these are fuel partitioning genes, fuel allocation genes. So here's another way to think about it. Men and women fatten differently. Men get fat above the waist. Women get fat below the waist. That's been clear for as long as there have been men and women. The question is, what do the calories have to do with it? This man doubled his risk of heart disease by getting fat above the waist, and this woman did not. Um, they both must be taking in more calories than they expend. As Newberg said, they must literally be overeating. But why did it go here in the man and there in the woman? What do a calories in, calories out hypothesis say about this sexual distribution? Localized fat distribution, steatopygia, okay? This is a genetic, uh, uh, genetic what? Genetic fat accumulation in African races and women, it clearly has nothing to do with how much they eat and exercise. Puberty is another example, okay? And again, a modern image, but this was an example the pre-World War II Europeans used, Germans and Austrians. Uh, boys and girls start, uh, enter puberty with roughly the same amount of fat on their bodies. Uh, they both get taller, they both get bigger, they both take in more calories than they expend. The boys tend to lose fat and gain muscle, and the girls tend to gain fat and gain it in very specific places, not everywhere, but in very specific places. So the question is, if they're both taking in more calories than they expend, why is it that the boys lose fat and gain muscle and the girls gain fat and gain it not everywhere? Okay, and the answer is clearly, well, they're getting bigger because they're secreting growth hormone and something called insulin-like growth factor is being stimulated. And fat accumulation and muscle accumulation clearly has a, a huge uh, endocrine um, input from the sex hormone. So maybe this is a hormonal issue. Just because this woman isn't getting excessively fat doesn't mean she's get, not getting fatter. Okay, and by the time uh, puberty is over, women have 50% more fat on their bodies than the men do. So where does this idea of energy balance come from? And I said it came from the late 1860s to 1920s and calorimetry, but ultimately it's about physics, okay? Why energy balance? The first law of thermodynamics. I know obesity researchers who cannot write a paper on obesity um, without mentioning the laws of thermodynamics, and I've often asked them, why is it only obesity that you'd write about thermo? If you're writing about heart disease, atherosclerosis, the accumulation, of plaques on the inside of arteries. You don't care about the laws of thermodynamics. Obesity, you do. So this is the law of energy conservation. It's the simplest of the laws of thermodynamics. It basically means that energy is conserved. You can't create it from out of whole cloth. So if energy is conserved, it means if a system gets bigger, delta E, if the change in energy of a system is anything but zero, then intake and expenditure have to change to accommodate that. So if somebody gets fatter, 
Intake has to be greater than expenditure such that delta E is positive. So that's all that says. It says the change in fat mass is equal to energy consumed minus energy expended. You could say that about anything. If a room gets crowded like this, more people had to enter than leave. If I get rich, I have to make more money than I spend. If the climate change, if the atmosphere is getting hotter, more energy has to enter the atmosphere than leave it. These are all conservation, the results of conservation principles. The problem is there's no arrow of causality here. By that I mean if this room gets crowded, as it has, I haven't told you anything about the cause if I say that more people entered than left. Okay, that's just something that had to happen for the room to get crowded. If I get richer, I haven't told you how I've gotten richer or why I've gotten richer if I say that I made more money than I spent. That's just something that has to happen. If the atmosphere is heating up, I haven't told you anything about climate change or global warming or greenhouse gases or methane or carbon dioxide if I say that more energy has entered it than left. What we did in obesity research, and this is the mistake, we took an uh, equation that said nothing about the cause of obesity. All it said is if somebody gets fatter, they have to overeat, to use Newberg's term. And we said that they get fatter because they overeat. This is how Jean Mayer put it in 1954. Jean Mayer was the most influential U.S. nutritionist uh, through the 1960s and 70s. He said, obesity, too many people believe, is explained by overeating. Actually, it should be recognized that this is simply restating the problem in a different way and reaffirming somewhat unnecessarily one's faith in the first law of thermodynamics. The laws of thermodynamics are always true. They tell us nothing about the cause of obesity. To explain obesity by overeating is as illuminating a statement as an explanation of alcoholism by chronic overdrinking. So now here's what I learned doing my research. When I started this, I thought, okay, this is crazy. We have this idea about obesity that's based on this misconception of a simple physical law. But it turned out there was this alternative hypothesis that had grown up in Europe in the 1920s and 1930s, actually from 1905 or 6 through the 1940. And in this hypothesis, it started with a simple concept. Instead of saying obesity is an energy balance disorder, you say obesity is a sort of excess fat accumulation. It's like the simplest possible statement of the problem. It has no... Um, no assumptions attached. Like, I've talked to physicians in the States who say when an obese person walks into their office, the first thing they wonder is, why does that people eat, person eat too much? How do I curb his or her appetite or get his, he or she to exercise? Whereas this hypothesis starts, the obese person walks into your office, the first thing you should think is, why has that person accumulated so much fat? So it's not an energy balance disorder, an overeating disorder, it's a fat accumulation disorder. And if you think of it that way, the very first question you might ask is, I wonder what regulates fat accumulation, okay? And this question of what regulates fat accumulation is actually left out of all the literature on obesity from the 1970s onward, despite all the interest in genetics and microbiome and everything else. What we care about is what regulates fat accumulation and fat cells. So in this hypothesis, overeating and inactivity are compensatory effects, they're not causes. And we don't get fat because we overeat, we overeat because our fat tissue is accumulating excess fat. So we change the direction of causality. In our conventional wisdom, we think changes in intake and expenditure change fat mass, in fact, drive changes in fat mass. In this hypothesis, we flip it. We say changes in fat mass, this is very well regulated, but we have to figure out what it is that regulates fat mass, and if we dysregulate fat mass, we'll have effects on intake and expenditure. So here's an analogy, growth, okay? Human growth of any kind. So this fellow, uh, Carl Anthony Towns, he was the uh, number one draft pick in the uh, NBA uh, a year ago, and he just won Rookie of the Year award. This is a photo from him when he was at University of Kentucky. And when he was in high school, he was going through a growth spurt. So this is what a New York Times article said about him. It said there just was never seemed to be enough food to satiate his growing body. After school, he would eat a foot-long sub before his mother's home-cooked dinners, even after having a hefty lunch of homemade chicken, rice, and vegetables, and his favorite snacks, granola bars and bunch of crunch. This kid ate all the time. The technical term was he was hyperphagic. But we don't care about that because he grew to be seven feet tall and 250 pounds. His BMI was only 25. 
And because he was seven feet tall, we think, well, you know, he was growing. I mean, he was growing massively, and that made him eat more. And so the arrow of causality goes that way. Now, here's the Gedanken experiment. Through the magic of uh, Photoshop, we've created Carl Anthony's twin brother, Anthony Carl. And Anthony's only six feet tall, but he also weighs 250 pounds, so his BMI is 34. And what's interesting, they both weigh 250, so they're both in the exact same positive energy balance their entire life. 250 pounds of positive energy balance. But with this one, Anthony Carl, because he's fat and his BMI is over 30, we assume he got that way because he ate too much or didn't exercise enough. So with Anthony Carl, we've got the causality going this way. With Carl Anthony, we've got the causality going that way. And my point, or the point of the pre-World War II Europeans, was that the causality always goes this way. In every human growth defect, change in energy balance is determined by hormones and other factors, and that drives changes in intake and expenditure. So this hypothesis was a German-Austrian hypothesis. It, too, had proponents. If we were going to refer to it today, we'd call it the von Bergmann hypothesis or the Bauer hypothesis. Gustav von Bergmann was a leading uh, internal medicine specialist in Germany pre-World War II. The most prestigious award in the German Society of Internal Medicine is the von Bergmann Medal. He was no quack. And Julius Bauer was a pioneer in the field of endocrinology and genetics at the University of Vienna when the University of Vienna was one of the great universities in the world, okay? Here's how Bauer put it in 1941. He used this term lipophilia to discuss fat accumulation. Lipophilia was a term, uh, love of fat, that they used to describe tissues that had this characteristic of wanting to accumulate fat. So in men, our abdomen, the skin, the, the tissue on our abdomen, those adipocytes, that adipose tissue is lipophilic, but our foreheads are not. Our back of our hands, we could get obese. We won't accumulate fat in these areas. In women, it's below the waist. So von uh, Bauer said in 1941, he said, like a malignant tumor like the fetus, the uterus of the breast of a pregnant woman, the abnormal lipophilic tissue seizes on foodstuffs, even in the case of undernutrition. It maintains its stock and may increase it independent of the requirement of the organism, a sort of anarchy exists. The adipose tissue lives for itself and does not fit into the precisely regulated management of the whole organism. A lipomatous subject may die of starvation and still remain lipomatous. So when he says things like a lipophilic tissue seizes on foodstuffs, even in the case of undernutrition, now we begin to have a hypothesis that could explain the coexistence of obesity and malnutrition in the same population. These women, these people, don't need too much food to get obese. They need something to just trigger obesity, just like when cancer is triggered in your body, that cancer, that tumor doesn't care about how much you're eating or exercise. It will take what it needs. So Eric Graff, who was a, directed the clinic at the University of Würzburg, who was the author of the, the textbook Metabolic Disease and Their Treatment. This textbook was written in German. Uh, Dubois actually asked Graff to translate it into English, which he did because Dubois said, we have no textbook made discussing this in English. Um, Graff called the set of this theory a condition of abnormally facilitated fat production and impeded fat destruction a sort of lipopomatosis universalis in the sense that the lipophilia in certain tissues is primary, the fat accumulation is primary, and the sparing in the energy expended is secondary. It pre presupposes overnutrition. If somebody's fat is triggered to get fat, whatever's happening, that will presuppose overnutrition. They will eat more or exercise less because their fat tissue is growing. Russell Wilder, who was a leading authority in diabetes at the Mayo Clinic in 1938, described it this way. He said, the effect after meals of withdrawing from the circulation even a little more fat than usual, 20 calories a day, remember, that's all we need, might well account both for the delayed sense of satiety and for the frequently abnormal taste for carbohydrate encountered in obese persons. A slight tendency in this direction would have a profound effect. 
The hypothesis deserves attentive consideration. Hugo Roney was a Hungarian uh, endocrinologist who emigrated to the U.S. in the 1920s, and he was, he was working at Northwestern University. He wrote the first monograph on obesity in the United States in 1940. He said the subsequent discovery that normal fat tissue is a site of considerable metabolic activity was looked upon by many as strongly supporting the theory, which is now more or less fully accepted, chiefly in Germany. And then the war comes along. And one of the interesting things, again, I had no idea about this when I started my research. Prior to 1940, the lingua franca of medicine was German. If you wanted to be a serious medical researcher and you lived outside of Germany or Austria, you had to at least read German so you could read the German medical journals, or ideally you spoke German so you could go to Germany and Austria and do a mentorship with these great professor, doctor, researchers. The war comes. All of this German and Austrian school evaporates, and after the war, the lingua franca of medicine switches to English, and obesity research is recreated in the U.S. by nutritionists at the Harvard School of Public Health who don't even treat obese individuals. They don't take case histories. They don't care about getting these people to lose weight or studying why they get fat and where they get fat. They study animals. And these people literally recreated the field of obesity as a simple problem of energy balance. By the 1960s, obesity was treated mostly by psychologists and studied mostly psychologists who were trying to figure out why obese people eat too much. This whole German-Austrian hypothesis vanished. And yet animal models of obesity continued to confirm that when animals get fat, they will get fat even when they're not allowed to increase their food intake. So Jean Mayer studied a strain of obese mice in the 1950s, said these mice will make fat out of their food under the most unlikely circumstances, even when half starved. They don't get fat because they eat too much. They get fat if they eat at all. And in fact, most of these and many of these animal models, you can starve them to death. They will die with more fat on their bodies than lean animals who are allowed to eat as much as they want. So here's a question. If obesity is sort of excess fat accumulation or hormonal regulatory disorder, what regulates fat accumulation? Okay. What regulates fat accumulation? And this is what we want to know. It's kind of simple. And this science was worked out. It required, unfortunately, technologies that weren't invented till the late 1950s. An ability to measure fatty acids in the bloodstream and an ability to measure hormones accurately in the bloodstream, which was published in 1960 by Rosalind Yalow and Solomon Burson. Yalow ended up winning the Nobel Prize for it because it revolutionized the field of endocrinology. So this is what we want to know. Here's a fat cell. Here's a cell membrane, and we want to know, here's where we care about energy in, energy out. If more energy goes into this fat cell and gets stored as fat, obviously the fat cell gets fatter. If more energy leaves the fat cell, the fat cell gets leaner, and we get leaner. So what controls this process? And it's pretty simple. So fat comes to the fat cells in mostly in lipoproteins like LDL, um, or chylomicrons, there's enzymes on this fat cell membrane called lipoprotein lipase that break down triglycerides in those lipoproteins into fatty acids, and the fatty acids are small enough that they could pass through the cell membrane. And then inside the cell, the fatty acids are technically called, they're esterified with a glycerol molecule into a triglyceride. The triglyceride, this is a very cool system, the triglyceride is too big to get out of the fat cell. So if you want to get the fat, you store the fat as triglyceride because it's too big to get out. And if you want to get it out, you have to break it down back into the fatty acids and the glycerol, which can escape through the membrane. So there are hormones in the fat cell called hormone-sensitive lipases that do that job. So anything that works to break down the triglycerides into fatty acids and move them into the fat cell and bind them up as triglycerides works to make us that fat cell fatter and us fatter. And anything that works to get the fat out of the fat cell works to make us leaner. It's a very simple system, and the question is, what controls that? And by the mid-1960s, it was clear, as Rosalind Yalow and Burson said in some of their first papers, that insulin is the principal regulator of fat metabolism. So this is a, a diagram from uh, Keith Frain at Oxford, his 2010 metabolic regulation textbook. I used it to show that the science didn't go away from 1965 to 2010. When you look at what controls fat storage and mobilization, it's insulin, 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 insulin. 
Okay, other hormones play a role, but insulin is dominant. Suppression of fat mobilization, as Yellow and Burson said, release of fatty acids from fat cells requires only the negative stimulus of insulin deficiency. If you want to get fat out of your fat cells and oxidize it, by the 1960s, the answer was lower insulin. Okay, get it as low as you can get it, and you will mobilize fat. So this doesn't say anything about eating more or exercising less. It just biologically, it says lower insulin. <clears throat> so here are the key points of fat cell regulation. <clears throat> When insulin is secreted or chronically elevated, fat accumulates in the fat tissue. That's textbook science, as I'll show you. When insulin levels drop, fat escapes from the fat tissue, and the fat depots shrink. And we secrete insulin primarily in response to the carbohydrates in our diet. Okay, all of that is conventional wisdom. It's textbook science. And George Cahill, who was a leading uh, diabetologist at Harvard in the 1960s, who uh, co-edited a textbook on this science in 1965, when I interviewed him in 2005, he said, carbohydrate is driving insulin is driving fat. That's a simple way to think about it. That's the textbook description. Now, the problem is if we take out these three words, is driving insulin, we're left with the literal equivalent, which is carbohydrate is driving fat. And now you've gone into quackery. Because now what you're saying is a calorie isn't just a calorie, that something about carbohydrates are uniquely fattening. And it's mediated through insulin. So this is Atkins' diet land. Carbohydrate is driving fat. But this sentence, carbohydrate is driving insulin is driving fat, is textbook science. So my contribution to this field, if any, is just to say, look, those things are logically equivalent. I don't care if Robert Atkins said the same thing 50 years ago. Maybe he was right. So here's the textbook. Leninger's Principles of Biochemistry. It's the, the most well-used biochemistry textbook in the U.S. You could go to the index, do this as an exercise, look up the word adipocyte, go to where it discusses adipocyte, which is a technical term for fat cell, and it'll tell you this. It'll say high blood glucose, which you get either if you're diabetic or you're eating a lot of uh, certain kinds of carbohydrates, elicits a release of insulin, which speeds the uptake of glucose by tissues and favors the storage of fuels as glycogen, which is a storage form of carbohydrate, and triglycerols, while inhibiting fatty acid mobilization in adipose tissue. So what makes fat cells fat? Well, high blood sugar and insulin. What makes people fat? You could look up the section on obesity, and it'll say to a first approximation, obesity is a result of taking in more calories than are expended. This paradigm is so powerful that even the biochemists who know this still think that this is why people get fat. And this is why I give this talk over and over again. As long as we think this energy balance thing says anything about why people get fat, we ignore basic human biology. We embrace physics. I'm all for physics. I think it's usually right. They do great science. But this is a biological issue. So here's the alternative hypothesis. Like any growth defect, obesity is a hormonal regulatory disorder. Okay, like any growth defect. Like type 2 diabetes, it's a fundamentally a disorder of insulin signaling, okay? So type 2 diabetes and obesity are so closely associated, you know, we know that they're, they're, they, they can be considered two sides of the same coin. They are both disorders of insulin signaling. There are other hormones assuredly involved in other problems, but fundamentally there's this, and it's triggered by the carbohydrate content of the diet, okay? Now, not to all carbohydrates, not any carbohydrate, depends the source and the processing of the carbohydrates. So bread, cereal, rice, and pasta, the high glycemic index, highly processed grains, um, have a high glycemic index, they're going to elevate blood sugar, they're going to raise insulin, and maybe more than anything is the seem suggested sweets, sugar, because of the fructose content. If sugar causes this disorder of insulin resistance, That means more insulin has to be secreted to do the job of facilitating glucose uptake, and so you're going to secrete more insulin to all of these. So here's the alternative hypothesis. Refined grains, starches, and sugars cause dysregulation of insulin signaling, and the result is excess fat accumulation, obesity, and the obesity epidemics. They very different hypothesis. It's a biological hypothesis, not a physics one.
So here are the implications. If you want to decrease or prevent excess adiposity and you're dealing with an energy balance disorder, you tell people to eat less, smaller portions, not too much, and exercise more. If you're dealing with obesity and you consider it a hormonal metabolic disorder, you remove the fattening carbohydrates and try to lower insulin. Should any of this be surprising? Okay. By the way, I don't have a clock up here, so I can't tell whether... I'm good? Just keep talking. <laughs> Five minutes, okay. History. Going back, if you could go back 200 years, farinaceous and vegetable foods. Farinaceous are starchy, grainy foods, and vegetable foods are fattening, and saccharine matters are especially so. British Journal of Nutrition, 1963. This was the first author in a, our first sentence in an article written by two of the leading dietitians in the UK. Every woman knows that carbohydrates are fattening. This is a piece of common knowledge which few nutritionists would dispute. Okay, I found in my research four uh, major universities in the United States that published diets for obesity in the late 1940s, 1950s. They were all identical to this one published by Raymond Green, who was a leading British endocrinologist in the mid-century. He was a brother of Graham Green, the novelist, in his textbook, The Practice of Endocrinology. So, fascinating. They divided into two groups, foods to be avoided, Bread, so this is before they understood the, that insulin regulated fat accumulation. Bread, cereals, potatoes, foods containing sugar. You don't eat those, okay, because they're fattening. That was the idea. We didn't know why they were fattening, but they were fattening. And you could eat as much as you like of the following foods, meat, fish, birds, all green vegetables, eggs, dried or fresh, cheese, fruit, except bananas and grapes. With the exception of a little bit of the fruit, this is the Atkins diet. Um, What's interesting, they don't say you should have 27 grams of this and 33 grams of this, and they don't talk about how many, when you should eat it or how you should eat it. The idea was pretty simple. Don't eat these foods because they have some inherent property that they're fattening. We pretty much understand why now why that is. And you can eat as much as you like of these because they don't have that quality. That simple. Okay, the problem is 1960s, we learn about this science, doctors come along like Atkins, uh, Herman Taller, and they start pushing these high-fat diets, and they start pushing high-fat diets at a time that the low-fat dogma, the idea that fat causes heart disease, was also cooking up. And by the 1970s, particularly with the success of Atkins' diet revolution, the medical community thought legitimately these were concerned cardiologists who were afraid these diets would kill people. They also thought obese people get fat because they eat too much, and any doctor who says, don't worry about how much you eat, is a quack who's trying to sell you something. So they did their best to remove the traces of this sign, of this implication that carbohydrates are fattening and maybe you should be eating a lot of fat instead from the textbooks, from the obesity research. And in doing so, like, this was Atkins and this was the science, the endocrinology that regula what regulates fat accumulation. If you're worried about this, you can go through and you can look at the data, what happens when people actually put Physicians, researchers actually put patients on carbohydrate-restricted, high-fat diets. Um, there's been, in the past five years alone, there's probably been 80 studies done on this. They're all very consistent. This was a meta-analysis published in 2012, 23 reports of the uh, effects of these carbohydrate-restricted, high-fat diets. And what's interesting, they're associated with significant decrease in body weight, body mass index, abdominal circum waist circumference, systolic blood pressure, diastolic blood pressure, triglycerides, fasting glucose, glycated hemoglobin, plasma insulin. Everything gets better when you tell people to eat less carbohydrates and replace it with fat. The only problem is LDL cholesterol may not get better, and we are fixated on this because of statins and our, the heart disease history, and the long-term health effects are unknown, which means if we tell people what to, to do, what we, they were doing from about 1820 through 1960, we don't know what's going to happen, except that all their health risk factors are going to improve. Metabolic syndrome, in effect, begins to resolve, if not resolves entirely. 
So I started this, in the process of this uh, talk, I discussed these populations with high levels of obesity um, in association with uh, malnutrition, poverty, hard-working populations. Ralph Richards was a British diabetes researcher specialist, met a doctor who went, moved to uh, Jamaica, uh, Kingston, Jamaica, around 1960, opened a diabetes clinic at the University of the West Indies, and in 1973, he spoke at a conference in the UK in London, and he reported that two-thirds of the adult women in Jamaica were obese, despite unbelievable poverty. And he said, most third world countries have a high carbohydrate intake as their economic dependence is predominantly agricultural with a heavy dependence on non-dairy produces. It's conceivable that the ready availability of starch and preference to animal protein contributing as it must the main caloric requirements of these populations leads to increased lipogenesis, fat formation, and the development of obesity. Notice he didn't say it leads these people to eat more and exercise less. It just leads to this hormonal milieu that fosters lipogenesis. It's another way. This is how Meyer might have put it. These women will make fat out of their food under the most unlikely circumstances, even when half starved. Um, I needed a slide to conclude my talk, so I borrowed this from the internet. And I have to thank all the whoever paleo, low-carb, high-fat people develop this. Um, it's just not that hard. Basically, you remove the starches, the grains, and the sugars, because the idea is that's what make, is making these people fat. Anyway, thank you very much. Um, I don't know if we have time for questions. <laughs>